It is time now for The Legal Beat with Newberger and Partners, LLP, playing talk about legal liberty and social justice issues that impact all Canadians. And today we are joined by Stacey Nichols for more of what we need to know and want to talk about. Um, and I guess let, let's start with the Jean Gameshi uh, trial because closing arguments are underway. Um, Ms. Robitaille leading the arguments uh, for the defense. Is that unusual? Would we expect to see Ms. Hennon up there? I would have thought so. I would have thought so. Um, although Ms. Robitaille, I, I know her as well, and she's more than capable. But when, when you just showed me that right before we started today, I was a bit surprised, I have to say. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what do you expect um, to hear at closing arguments? I mean, both sides has to sum up their entire case, basically. Right. You know, the, obviously the defense wants to point out to the judge all of these many inconsistencies and the possibility of collusion and all of the issues with the Crown's case that uh, we're all well aware of through mm -hmm. throughout the last two weeks. So they will be focusing, the defense will be focusing mainly on that. Mr. Gomeshi didn't testify, so they don't have to deal in any way with uh, any defense evidence. And, you know, the Crown, I don't know what the Crown's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Crown, in their closing will obviously have the best that they can try to address um, and you know try to convince the judge that the the inconsistencies that were brought out during the evidence aren't important and that the complainant should still be de believed despite the inconsistencies but you know I think that they yeah, probably... well, Michael Callan is quoted as here saying the defense may try to undermine the credibility of the third complainant because she delayed disclosing the sexual account encounter she had after but uh, the Crown notes that she did, in fact, go to police before going to court and then explained that she was embarrassed about it. And I mean, we're hearing that so much more, that people, it, it's like put out and shut up, really, um, and just like don't say anything about it, it's just easier. Right. And, and I think we all know women that say that that's happened to them. It was just easier to, to get it over and done with. But I mean, credibility such an issue in, in this case. It's a huge issue. And as has been said uh, in the media in the last week or so, I, you know, the issue is not so much about how complainants are supposed to behave or what a normal person would do after they've been assaulted. But it's the fact that they're, you know, they didn't disclose all of these issues to the police and to the crown, the crown ahead of time. I mean, um, if they had been forthright from the beginning, it, it would have been a different story. Well, there is, in fact, those. There is some questioning on the behavior, because I've talked to people who have covered courts for years mm -hmm. and said, you know, the typical. <laughs> this is not typical. Uh, their their demeanor on the stand, the way they they behave. Uh, this is this is not. So, uh, this is not the behavior traditionally of women who have been traumatized by sexual assault. Right, and I, I, unfortunately I didn't get to watch any of the, the trial, I didn't get down there to see any of it, um, so I can't really speak to the demeanor, the actual mm -hmm. demeanor of the witnesses, but um, yeah, I, I mean I, I think we can safely say that there is no one way a, a person should act after... No. But there is a range. Sure there's a range, there, sure there's a range, and there's certainly, you know, things that would would make sense that or that one would do or not do after experiencing a tra traumatic event with someone. And there are also questions about why this information that came as a surprise. I mean, for example, the relationship after the fact. Right. And people saying, well, I didn't know that that mattered in any way, that we dated after. Right. Uh, what's wrong with the system that that, that would be a surprise. Right. Well, I, you know, the there have been some articles that I've read out there. The police are under some fire for not investigating the matter properly, um, and they're, you know, the Crown has been under some fire for not uh, presenting the case in in the best light that it could have, and properly preparing the witnesses for what they surely were going to face. But, you know, if the complainants aren't divulging that these emails existed and this this um, subsequent contact with Mr. Gomeshi existed, I mean, you know, the police and the Crown can't be mind readers. You know, this seemed to be, a lot of this information just seemed to be an absolute bombshell, you know, that uh, that Miss Hennon brought out during the trial. Now, moving to an, another, uh, another case, the sentencing um, is underway, a sentencing hearing for Dennis Olin in the second degree murder of his father, uh, Richard Olin, in a St. John court. Um, that has now been adjourned, and the judge saying he will have a ruling by 
two, um, and of course it's an hour ahead down there, so that's just less than a, less than two hours, right. um, two hours away. But he was listening um, uh, to uh, all kinds of all kinds of, of um, evidence um, that there was currently a publication ban on any of the details. So it's a little. I know the CBC is trying to have all the exhibits made um, made public. Um, but he's trying to find out um, parole eligibility. Right. Um, so there was such an outcry about the quality of the police investigation mm -hmm. in this case. How much impact do you think that may have on, on this? I, well, at the end of the day, I mean, he was found guilty of killing his father. I, I don't think that the police investigation really is going to come into play in the sentencing process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought, just sort of switching on that, I thought something that I read was very interesting in relation to that case this morning is that I think the judge had to take some time because there were some 79 or something, I can't remember exactly, letters of support for mm -hmm. Mr. That's Oland. That's what he was reading. He needed time. Well, she said he right. needed time to absorb everything he has heard from, from these letters. Um, right. And, but apparently the judge was quite, um, he was quite upset by the content of some of the letters because a lot of the letters contained, you know, uh, his, so Mr. Olin's supporters' opinion on the guilty verdict and, you know, expressed opinion on the fact that he should never have been convicted. And I just thought that was really interesting because obviously we uh, put forth letters of support for people all of the time. It's a very important part of the sentencing process. Uh, but, you know, we're generally always very careful to keep that, you know, um, not to present letters that would, would uh, give that type of information because it's just, you know, the decision's already been made. Whether or not mm -hmm. there's appeal and what an appeal and what happens down the road is a different story. But uh, it's just not generally an appropriate thing to put before the judge. Mm -hmm. Well, all twelve jurors recommend that all would have no chance of parole for ten years. However, the final decision does rest with with the judge, John um, Walsh, about whether he will get bail pending the hearing of the appeal. Right. Yeah, I thought that was interesting that the jury recommended 10 years. That's, all, that's the, the least amount yeah. that they could recommend. Um, and considering, again, that they did find him guilty in quite violent circumstances of murdering his father, the fact that they're putting forth, um, you know, sort of the minimum sentence or minimum eligibility for parole in those circumstances is sort of interesting. Now, how uh, we're, we're up to day eight of the Tim, um, the, the trial into Tim Bosma's death. Um, that was... Uh, the trial of two men who were accused of murdering Bosman nearly three years ago. They were hearing um, yesterday about his last cell phone calls and um, the path the prosecutors say his alleged killers took on the night he died. Um, you know, w we heard testimony about how the trailer containing his, his truck, obviously key evidence in the trial, uh, was left unsecured, um, all kinds of things that were happening again, with evidence and the way it was held after being discovered in, in this case. Mm -hmm. How much of a concern is that? Well, I, I saw that. Unfortunately, I don't know. I mean, there was, a, you know, a box apparently flew out of the mm. trailer when the police were transporting uh, because, you know, the, the trailer wasn't secured properly. I didn't, I didn't get any information about what may or may not have been in that box um, and whether it was essential. I mean, if there was well, some... It was also run over by an unmarked police right. car I as it was, flew over there. <laughs> but, I mean, when you, see, when you see, you know, the television shows like CSI, I mean, mm -hmm. though, if they've got a vehicle, it's... You know, signed, sealed, delivered, right. carried, moved into this. It does. It's not just mm -hmm. driving along the highway with stuff flying out of it. Right. I mean, that's evidence. It, yeah, it is evidence, and certainly, you know, like we were just talking about too, um, sloppy police procedure in you know maintaining evidence in a trial can factor in, particularly if the evidence is something that's crucial, mm -hmm. you know, to the prosecution's case. Now, speaking of something that's, uh, I don't know about this one. This is a story. Um, you know, parents that are looking for a reason to monitor their child's online activities should know about Daniel Labutt. That, that um, on Monday, um, the 27-year-old pleaded guilty to three sex-related charges, possession of child porn, transmitting sexually explicit materials to a minor, and communicating with a minor for a sexual purpose. Now, at the center of this case is a nine-year-old London, Ontario girl, who posted a profile on the dating site Plenty of Fish and ended up catching the attention of um, La Daniel Labutt and his girlfriend. They began talking to the girl online. 
had sex in front of a webcam for the girl to watch and started a plan to go camping with her so they could all have sex together. Um, so the girl uh, had taken photographs and, and mailed them to the couple, but like, what happened with, with this case? Um, you know, the defense and the Crown had joint sentencing submission of 15 months, um, but predatory behavior. Um, but this, again, this was foiled by a snooping mother. Right. Well, it doesn't not highlight the need to, in this digital age, to monitor our kids on the internet. I mean, it's just unbelievable. This girl, you know, the most shocking thing to me that was this girl's nine years old. Nine years nine old. Nine years old. Yeah. And nine he years said old. he thought maybe she might have been underage. Well, right. a little young. Yeah. I mean, seriously? Nine? Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, I, I have an almost nine-year-old, and I don't, I don't know how a child that age just comes to know, first of all, how to post a profile onto Pl Plenty of Fish. That's what surprised me. I mean, I guess kids are just getting more and more knowledgeable about this stuff, but mm -hmm. it, wow, does or it Or maybe they think it's fun, or may, we don't know the girl, and I don't know nine-year-olds anymore, right? right? Mm -hmm. Because my children are grown up. I don't know where they're at in today's world. Mm -hmm. But maybe she thought it was just fun. Plenty of fish sounds... Right. Well, no, I mean, she got into... I mean, she was con convinced, because I don't think, you know, that the couple did in encourage the girl to masturbate while they watched. She did take photographs um, of her private parts. She sent them to the couple. Um, she was communicating with them. Um, and there was also discussion about the girl moving in with the couple. Right. So, um, but her mother... Um, must have flipped. Oh, to be honest. I don't. I, mean, I had all the security, I had all the nanny settings that you could possibly have, and that was okay. You know, when my like 15 years ago, when my kids were mm -hmm. little, little. But now they all have smartphones. You can't be right. blocking everything no. that they're carrying around. You can't. You but you just have to be on them all the time and checking and checking what they've looked at. I mean, it's just it's so this it particularly to me because of her age just highlights the huge importance of that. But thank goodness. Uh, because who knows how many other people that, you know, how many other children these two would have preyed on if, if the, this mother hadn't intervened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think parents almost need, Stacy a course in how Absolutely. to monitor mm -hmm. their children's online presence. So te technologically, I would have a problem with it. I would be, <laughs> I would be phoning Kate 24 hours a day saying, now how do I find out where... Mm -hmm they've been. Absolutely. You almost need a course in this. Yeah, that's actually, you know, that's a very, very good point. And it's something, you know, maybe it's out there already, but it's it's a great thing for parents to think about. I have a very technologically inclined husband, yeah. which is nice. Um, and he, you know, we have an 11 year old as well. So he's already starting to monitor what's going on there. And you're okay until they're 16. And then at 16, you run into other issues. Right. Privacy. Right. Because I co they can't tell you that they've skipped school at 16 because, you know, right. that's not your business. Right. Yeah, I sent mine to a private school. They called, they called you if they weren't there. They but if you can't send your child to a private school, I mean, you can monitor them up to a certain point, and then you, you know, you, you have to be educated on what you can legally do and not do. That's true. I, I mean, I think my position will always be, if I'm paying for all of these electronics, mm -hmm. and I'm paying for your, Oh, that's, you know, that would be what, my position, yeah. but, you know, I'm looking at it. But, but, yeah. but kids can move out at 16 if they want. That's so true. they could they could technically turn around and say, this is illegal. Well, mm -hmm. we have um, we had various things from removing the keyboard so that they couldn't actually type, or changing the Wi-Fi password every day. You want right. today's Wi-Fi password? Here's what you have to get done before you get it. Mm -hmm. And then all those I could monitor them easily. But it used to drive them crazy. So yeah. they would they would find other ways of communicating with their friends mm -hmm. that you know that I couldn't that I couldn't monitor. But again, you know, we're talking about 15 years later. I mean, our children were in a different age, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it was a different hey, time. Hey, we still had dial-up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, they had a cell phone with a basic plan, and it was, you know, I mean, but it wasn't it wasn't the stuff available, and they weren't, no. you know, and they all talk about it, and you don't know what's going on at school. Oh, and, absolutely. I, I miss the old days. I saw an advertisement the other, or just, sorry, uh, on Facebook, uh, a, a joke kind of thing, and don't you miss these days, and it was like a teenage girl lying on the floor with the cord, mm -hmm. you know, from the phone hanging on the wall and we're just you know it's amazing how much has changed in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Are courts um, are they are they cracking down on 
on people that are moving towards young people online. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, to me, even that sentence is on the low side, and I think that I think it was over three years in total because he had spent the time up to his sentencing in custody. Yeah, total sentence of three years and six months um, because of time served. Right. Yeah. So, uh, but I but I think the judge mentioned that if it hadn't been a joint position between the crown and the defense, that um, you know the judge may have gone higher than that. I think you know praying on a nine-year-old in those circumstances that that needs to be a high sentence. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and uh, talking to us about all things legal today. And we had a lot, um, a lot to cover. Uh, going on uh, these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good for you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And before we go, don't forget to download our podcast mm -hmm. on iTunes, brought to you, in fact, by Newberger and Partners, LLP, one of Canada's leading criminal defense law firms, expertly defending clients since 1992. Visit them online at nrlawyers.com. Click the channel subscribe button for full-length interviews and more from What She Said here on YouTube.